Bethel Bible Chapel. Great to see each one here. Uh, quite a few are finding their seats, so we'll just help them to do that. Great to be able to uh, share God's Word with you together this morning and worship together. We're looking forward to Ryan Lidstone continuing our study on the prophet Elijah, some great practical lessons that we are going to learn from God's Word today. We thank you. Uh, we're looking forward to um, John Barbin leading us in worship. And so, um, yeah, we're thankful to have this arranged today. So, for everyone that's in this room, I hope you got one of these. This is very important for you to pick this up on your way in on the north and south door. Uh, we try to put as much in this that you need to know <clears throat> for things that are happening over the next couple weeks here at Bethel Bible Chapel. The other way you can connect with us and ensure that we're not missing everything, anything is for you to go on our webpage and look at all the things that are posted there um, on our website. So just to stay current for all the things uh, that are being planned. So read through this. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. We have this, uh, we have Secret Church that is happening on Friday, April the 19th. And there's some books, prayer guides that are uh, available in the <clears throat> foyer after service. And Sandy Snell will be there. Um, we just saw a little bit of a clip uh, of that. So if you want more information, it's insert in your bulletin. So please read through that so that you can uh, be aware of what's happening here. Tonight we're planning a prayer meeting. So the first Monday, Sunday of every month, we do a collective prayer meeting in the fellowship hall uh, where you had coffee this morning. We've got a lot of challenges here at Bethel. One of the challenges is that at some point we need to do a facility upgrade, and we're asking the Lord to give us direction on what that looks like. Uh, it means an expansion here on this property. It maybe means going somewhere else, looking for another building. All those things are, uh, are, are possible, but we're looking for the Lord's hand in direction for these things. So we want to come together and pray together. We want to pray as a family and as a church group, uh, a church family and as a church, to ask the Lord for his direction. We don't want to step out. We don't want to be ahead of the Lord, and we don't want to be behind him. We want to be in step with him. And the challenge for us is that we need to make some decisions fairly quickly. Also, we want to pray for wisdom for the elders and the deacons as they deal with all the issues of an expanding church family and uh, all the needs that are around us. Also, on the April 19th uh, weekend, that's a Friday, the elders and the pastors are going to do their, our annual retreat. We go away from uh, as much of the, the, the uh, noise of church, and we try to get away to somewhere quiet, and we have a Friday night and a Saturday uh, alone to yeah, just pray through all the things this uh, church body needs. So we would covet your prayers to pray for us as we go, and we uh, you know, kind of remove ourselves. We're going to be like Elijah in, uh, in that brook, uh, Cherith. We're going we're gonna to be alone with the Lord and we're going to pray for his hand uh, on this church and for us in our leadership, what that means and what that looks like. And so it's significant to have and to see God's leading. So, um, yeah, we're going to look at all those things. So prayer tonight, uh, we want you to come out. We want to see as many as possible to pray together through all the things that we need. And we'll have a little bit of a prayer guide so that can keep us on track as we pray for um, the needs of this church family. Sunday night, April the 21st. So every Sunday night through the month, we have a different, um, uh, thing, a different uh, program organized. On the 21st, we're going to have a talent night. For some of you that have been here for many years, you remember we used to do this on New Year's Eve. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers that, but anyways, kind of neat thing to do. Um, so we're trying to get families to participate, young and old. Uh, this doesn't have to be long. It can be three minutes, four minutes. It can be a few seconds. It can be a duo. It can be a single. Uh, we're looking for things that are uh, humorous, out of the ordinary, odd, 
uh, silly, whatever. We're looking for talent that is represented here in this room. We know there's all kinds of talent. And we want a time when we can get together as a church body and uh, have a few laughs together, pray together, and just enjoy each other's fellowship. So that's the 21st. So there's going to be a sign-up in the corridor foyer. And uh, just write down what, what it is that you're going to do. Um, not that we're going to vet this through, but um, we don't want anybody breathing fire or anything in here. Um, you know, but anyways, we just what you're going to do, and uh, yeah, we'll help us organize the night. Really, that's it, what it's for. It's for the MC that'll take care of organizing that, uh, just to know how we can stage people. So the 21st Sunday night at the Fellowship Hall, uh, we're looking forward to a talent night for all you very talented people. Secret Church, we already did that. Nicholas has an announcement for a fundraiser. Please. Sure. So, Bethel Youth Group is heading, we, at the end of the year, sort of a send-off. We are taking a group of teens from our youth group down to Ancaster, Ontario, to Redeemer University for a youth conference put on by the Gospel Coalition. Um, it's going to be a Friday, Saturday, so we're heading down there taking a group. But we want to invite you to help us cover some of the costs that go there by inviting you to lunch next week. So if you don't have plans after service in the fellowship hall, we will have uh, soup and bread and desserts. Come with your family. Enjoy uh, by donation. And we'll serve you lunch, and you can help send us uh, with the support with savory soup. So this is, this is what we're, we're doing. So I hope you would mark that in your calendar, um, and, and feel free to, to join us. We'd, we'd love any support you have would be, would be great. And if you're a teen who has been thinking, maybe I'll go and not go, uh, we've talked about it for months, and you haven't said anything, and your parents are like, you should go, and you decide, yes, talk to Kara or Esther today. Um, this, we need to cut this off pretty soon so we can start planning for that. So that is next Sunday after service. Please join us for lunch. Thank you. Okay. Again, a couple more items. Um, Ryan's going to give us an update on the seniors' brunch and a few other things uh, when he comes up to speak. So I won't mention any of those. Ladies' banquet coming, caring for the hearts coming. Um, yeah, this is very, very uh, good to us for us to pray through and be aware of what's happening. We also have a tear-off, which is a contact card. If there's anything that you would like to uh, know about us or you want us to know about you, a contact, a prayer, um, pull, pull this off and put it in a little basket called, um, yeah, contacts, and we'd love to be able to pray with you, pray for you, and uh, understand some of the needs you may have. Also, this serves as a great on your fridge list of those that we're praying for uh, that are in need of God's hand in their life. So, yes, Andrew. Uh-huh. Uh, and so all that is for sale. Oh. So I'm not saying that's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> Did that already. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate that. I didn't see that it was for sale. Interesting. Wow. Okay, so, yeah, a lot of prayer. A lot of need for God's direction. So some um, prayer requests. Uh, Keith Nicole went through his surgery uh, very well. Uh, it was a successful surgery. We need to pray for the Lord to give him strength. It's very painful. He's going to be in the hospital for five to seven days. And um, pray for that. His biopsy of his removed cancer uh, will come back, that they got everything that is needed, and that he can start his recovery. Uh, and we just pray that the Lord's hand would be on him and his family. Craig Martinek, we want to pray for Craig in his cancer treatment, and so we wanted to pray for Craig and Stephanie. We want to pray for Weston. Susan Horenowitz's grandson is um, having brain tumor surgery, and this is, I think, the third surgery that he's had. A uh, strong young boy, but it, it's, it's, it's still there and present. He's having it Tuesday in Philadelphia. So we need to pray for the surgeons and all those that are involved. We've been praying for Weston for 
a lot of years. And we're praying that the Lord's hand would be on him. We want to continue to pray that, uh, that the Lord would bring him through uh, this surgery and the Lord would give him um, full healing. So we need to do that. We want to pray for um, those that are grieving, uh, that have just lost loved ones in the last little bit, and even for those that have lost loved ones uh, that go back months and maybe even earlier in the year. Uh, we just, earlier in last year, we want to pray for the Lord's hand as you have a lot of firsts as we go through that, uh, yeah, together. So we need to pray for that. Uh, we have a lot of need here in our chapel, and we want to make sure that we are, yeah, just faithful in upholding each other in prayer. We need each other. We've talked many times about this body being um, uh, very much like a human body, and every part needed, and every part needs to work together. And when one part is sorrowful, we're all sorrowful. sorrowful. And when one part is joyful, we need to be joyful together. So we're very connected that way. And we want to make sure that we remember those things as we pray and lift each other up and edify and encourage uh, each other in our most holy faith. So let's do this together as we open this service in prayer and we ask for the Lord's hand and we're thankful for each family that was represented here. We want to ask that the Lord would bless each one of you as you worship with us this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we're thank you, thankful for your hand of mercy and grace on us. Lord, we thank you that uh, you're above all things, and your thoughts are above our, way, our thoughts, and your ways above our ways. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful that we don't understand everything, Lord, and nor should we, but we trust you in everything because of your faithfulness. Lord, we think of all the things that we've arranged, and we arrange this in your will. We you know your word is very clear that uh, if we go here or we go there, we don't make these plans just for self-serving, but we do it in the will of God. And we ask, Lord, that you would show us clearly... Uh, the direction in everything that we plan. We think of our prayer service tonight, and we ask, Lord, that you would give us direction. We ask for all the things that are needed, and we think of the blessings that we have in Sunday school and in our ministries, and we want to give you the honor and the glory for these things. And at the same time, Lord, we know that things are not, uh, uh, they don't stay uh, stagnant, and they, mo they move forward with change and with uh, a, a different uh, uh, just application, Lord, but we want to make sure that we're in step with you. And Lord, we ask for your help and your guidance in this, Lord. We think of Keith Nicole. We pray for him right now for Weston in this, this surgery that's coming on Tuesday. We pray for our family that is sick, that are going through cancer treatments, Lord, that are going through health challenges. We think of grieving. Lord, there's so many needs, and yet we know that we can bring this before your throne. We thank you for the confidence we have in your word, that we can find help in time of need, and we are in need, and we need help. So, Lord, we pray this. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us, you would direct us, and that we would feel your hand on everyone that's gathered here this morning. We thank you for each family that's represented, and we ask you'll bless them, that you'll bless uh, the word that's being spoken today for the songs that we're going to lead in singing right now, and, Lord, that our ears would be open and our hearts would be ready to accept your word. Lord, we thank you for Jesus who makes this all possible. We thank you for the resurrection that we has, have just um, uh, celebrated. We thank you that if, if it wasn't for a risen Lord and Savior, we would have nothing to say. We thank you. He is alive. He is risen indeed. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If we can all stand. You know, with the busyness of work and the stress and stresses of family or financial burdens or death or sickness... <laughs> I want everybody just to focus on God this morning because that's why we're all here. We're all here to worship God together. He's the reason why we're here. And let's bring it back to him this morning. When the music fades and all is Simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required you 
search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you
shame and reproach by thee bear and he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory for You 
spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. Sing right upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? What can I do? Thank you, John and team. Every Sunday, I'm, I'm blown away. I talked about that talent show. Blown away by the, the talent and the skill uh, that we see displayed up here on stage in, in our worship uh, songs, in our bands. And I'm not so much blown away by the skill as much as I'm blown away by the fact that they're willing and, and able to use that skill to lead us uh, in worship. And that's something really special. It's something that... Um, is really loved about coming together and gathering as a body and, and singing together, singing praises to our God. So thank you, team, for leading us in that. Um, we are going to be looking this morning 
at uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 to 16, continuing our series uh, in uh, looking at Elijah. But before we do that, I do have a few uh, pre-message announcements. Um, Andrew had his hands pretty full up here with all the announcements, so I said I'll take a few for you, um, ones that I have a vested interest in. So first, uh, coming up on June 14th and 15th, is uh, we call it the Superior 3-on-3 Basketball Tournament. Now, for those of you who uh, remember at Old Bethel, um, we would host this basketball tournament, and there would be just a ton of people out from the community getting involved and um, enjoying some 3-on-3 basketball. Last year, we started it up again, but for anyone who's been anywhere near our parking lot, you know we can't play it here. Um, Gravel and basketball doesn't mix well together. Uh, So we've partnered with Bethany Baptist. Uh, They have a nice paved parking lot. We go there. Last year, we had over 30 teams registered and and who played in this tournament, Uh, largely unchurched uh, people who who played. Um, And at its max, we probably had about 300 people there. So it's a really good opportunity uh, for the church to be involved in something positive in the community. And it's a really good opportunity to just be witnesses Um, to our community. Now, in order for that to happen effectively, we need lots of volunteers. Um, There's a sign-up sheet in between the bathrooms. Uh, If you are interested in volunteering uh, for something during that tournament, you don't necessarily need to know a lot about basketball. Uh, We have all sorts of different positions you can volunteer for. Please sign up. If you have questions, you can talk to me. Uh, last year, as I said, we had a max of about 300 people, and I think a max of about 11 volunteers. So we're looking to, like, times that number by five this year. Um, Bethany's also going to have some people there volunteering. So it'll be just a really good way for the church to be involved in our community. That's June 14th and 15th. My whole philosophy with asking for volunteers, I've learned this from camp, ask far enough in advance so people don't realize they're busy, So when it comes to that time, you're already committed. So that's what I'm doing today. So please sign up and commit uh, to to helping out with that. Second is coming up on April 20th is the Seniors Brunch. I can see there's been a lot of sign-ups already. The page is actually full, but that doesn't mean we're out of room. Just flip the page over and sign up. Uh, Last week... Not that you can't just show up if you didn't sign up, uh, but last week will be the last time you have your chance to put your name on the list, so we kind of have an idea of uh, numbers, um, of what to expect. The C&C group is helping with that, uh, so they put it on, um, me and a couple of others just hang out in the kitchen and help with the cooking. Um, I wanted to mention something specifically about that this year, though. If you're watching at home online because you can't come out to Bethel for whatever reason, or if you know somebody who calls Bethel home who cannot come out to Bethel uh, for whatever reason, health reasons, whatever it might be, you can let me know, uh, send me a message, an email, or whatever, and what we can do on that day is we can bring brunch to them. Um, That way, people who maybe aren't able to come out but would like to uh, can still enjoy that and, and feel, you know, some connection to the family here at Bethel. So just let me know, uh, and I'll write their names down. We'll get their address, and and we'll have some people deliver um, brunch to them. So that's April 20th. Third announcement. This is third of four. Um, This evening, so well after the prayer meeting at 9 o'clock, there's a group of men here at Bethel who play hockey uh, at the outdoor rink. Lately, we've had about eight guys show up, plus two goalies, so that's we play three on three, and then that's one sub. I'm not in good enough shape to only have one sub. Uh, so we're looking for a few more guys to join. If that's something that might interest you, again, you can talk to me. Uh, we'd love to have you out. Uh, it's at the Mill Market tonight at 9 o'clock. Fourth and finally, um, I've been given a mic, so I have to mention Camp ABK. Um, it is spring, and as summer approaches, I begin to think more and more and more about camp and the needs there. We have lots of opportunity for people to volunteer. Um, Pretty much every week is blank. Uh, So so if that's something that you would be interested in, please do talk to me uh, and we can fit you in a volunteer position um, somewhere at camp. And we'd also appreciate your prayer as we head into the season. So we have lots of registrations coming in. We're really excited about that. 
we have some very specific things that need to happen before camp starts. The big thing is, last year, near the end of the summer, somebody came up to me and said, hey, is the backfield supposed to be bubbling? The answer is always no. Um, we had uh, a failure of our septic system for our dining hall. Uh, end of the season, so we knew we could take care of it uh, before this season, but it has to be done because the dining hall is a pretty essential place at camp. Um, and we are in, currently uh, trying to get approval for that, but the government doesn't move the speediest, uh, and, and we do have to get approval from the Ministry of Environment. So we just pray that that happens quickly. It is April. We are going to be having people there May long weekend, so it's getting kind of to be a tight deadline as far as being able to get everything done that needs to get done for that. Also pray for... Um, uh, just provision. Uh, we're going to be talking about that actually in, in this morning's message, uh, but provision. We've been given uh, an estimate from our engineer that it could cost anywhere between $70,000 and $170,000. There's a very wide range, um, and uh, CAMP is absolutely a nonprofit organization. We didn't plan for this. Um, so there has already been a lot of generosity in God's people that we've seen, uh, so we just appreciate prayer. As you're thinking about CAMP, for that specifically, and also just for all the things that have to happen in order for camp to run smoothly this summer. So as I mentioned, springtime, we start thinking about camp. The other thing that I really enjoy about the spring is we start to see um, some, some playoff hockey. Uh, I'm a hockey fan. Uh, I enjoy watching hockey, and I especially enjoy watching our hometown hockey team, the Sioux Greyhounds, uh, because you know what? Some years, maybe they don't do that well. This year, they're doing really well. We enjoyed watching uh, the playoff series last uh, round. Um, they won. They're looking ahead to playing Saginaw, and uh, my family and I, we really enjoy taking that in. It's good entertainment, uh, really exciting to watch. One thing, though, that I specifically love about playoff hockey is you start to see in these teams who are kind of putting it all out on the ice, you start to see some determination, some grit, and some character uh, on display. In fact, in almost every post-game report that I've read, because um, I am following, I guess, rather closely, in every post-game report that I've read, the coach of the Greyhounds and the coach even of the other team talks about the character of their team. The character that's been developed over the course of a season, over the course of ups and downs, winning streaks, losing streaks, injuries, penalties, whatever it might be, they talk about this character that has developed as, as the team goes through their season, and then you hope that this character shines through as they're playing in the playoffs where there's a lot on the line as far as hockey's concerned. So I've been thinking a lot about character as I, I watch hockey, and I've been thinking a lot about character as I've been studying this passage in 1 Kings chapter 17. Specifically, I've been thinking about Christian character. And what I mean by that, I, I can kind of quickly define it here. Um, Christian character is, is character that we as Christ followers ought to be displaying to those around us and just be displaying in our everyday lives. A friend of mine and I, we've been challenging ourselves this year with memorizing the Sermon on the Mount. We've been listening to a podcast by The Bible Project. They're going into a year-long study and just deep diving into the Sermon on the Mount. It's a really good podcast. If you're a podcast person, I would highly recommend listening to that podcast. And in the Sermon on the Mount, as we read Jesus' words, as we read his teaching, we see a lot of what defines Christian character. Christians ought to be poor in spirit, be humble, be meek. Uh, Christians ought to be pursuing righteousness. They ought to be merciful, pure in heart. They ought to be lights to the world in how they live. They ought to love others. And the list goes on as we read the Sermon on the Mount and really as we read the Gospels and we see Jesus' ministry here on this earth we get a really good picture of what Christian character is all about. Really, it's about living and trying to be like Jesus every day of our lives and displaying that character that we see in Christ, that character that we know to be true in our God. I want to briefly look, as an introduction to this passage, at some Old Testament individuals that I think display this Christian character. Think of Abraham. In obedience, 
to God, he was willing to sacrifice, to give of his one and only son. Think of Joseph, raised to number two in Pharaoh's kingdom because of his wisdom. Think of Moses' faith in raising his hands and watching the Red Sea split in two so the Israelites could walk on dry land. Think of David's bravery as he slays Goliath with just a slingshot. Think of Elijah, who we're studying, and his boldness in calling fire down from heaven. Think of Daniel's obedience to his God to the point where he faced hungry lions because he was unwilling to turn away from what his God asked him to do. Think of Peter, who's a rock to the New Testament church. We see this theme all throughout Scripture, men and women of God standing strong in who they are in God. All the characters I just mentioned and the stories I just mentioned, I think would be kind of the highlights of... um, the highlights of their their lives, I guess I would say. Like when I think of David, I think of David victoriously standing over Goliath with with his slingshot in hand. When I think of uh, Moses, the immediate picture that comes to my mind is him standing there at the Red Sea as it's being uh, split apart so the Israelites can escape the Egyptians. When we decided as a speakers group to speak on Elijah, the immediate thought that came into my mind was the boldness that he had in, in um, calling fire down from heaven and the confidence in which he has it. Seriously, if you read ahead, which you can absolutely do in this story of Elijah, you see just how confident he was in his God as he's calling fire down from heaven. But something that I often don't think about is the story that leads up to these kind of climaxes of how these men and and these women of faith develop that character that they have to stand uh, so confidently in their God. Before Abraham could step out in faith offering his one son, he waited and he waited and he failed in waiting for this promised child. Before Joseph rose to his position of power because of this wisdom that we know he has, he was imprisoned, falsely accused, and he was sold into slavery by his brothers, seemingly forgotten about. Before Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, he argued with God that he wasn't the right man to do it because of a physical hurdle. David was a shepherd before he became this soldier that slayed Goliath. Daniel quietly and faithfully prayed to God daily before he was faced with these lions in the lion's den. Peter denied knowing Jesus and then kind of hid out and went back to his fishing career when he thought Jesus was dead before Jesus called him back and and he um, became the rock that Jesus called him to be. Christian character may be on display in these big moments that we see in Scripture, but it is built in the small ones. And I think that that's what this passage points to this morning for us when we look at the story of Elijah. Last year, uh, my, my grandfather passed away, and he was a man of character. I looked up to him, I respected him, and, and I learned a lot from him. And one of the biggest blessings about having his funeral and and meeting people who kind of knew him throughout his life were hearing these stories, these little stories about how his character had developed and been built over the years. And it opened my eyes to a really important thing, which is this Christian character that we speak of, this being like Christ, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lifetime of building this character to be men and women who follow God. I was at a missions conference a couple years ago. We brought some of our summer staff to it. So it was a missions conference specifically designed to call young people uh, to, to consider joining the mission field, to consider proclaiming the gospel to those who had never heard it before. 
And they had a missionary speak at this missions conference. And one of the things that he said that stuck with me was the plane ride isn't going to change who you are. And what he meant by that is if you're not living in obedience to God where God has placed you, if you're not evangelizing to, loving those who are around you in your family, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your school, wherever it might be, the plane ride's not going to change you. That developing that heart for missions, developing that heart for people happens in the small moments and in the big moments. In a commentary I read about this chapter, the author points out something really interesting about 1 Kings 17. Elijah is introduced as Elijah the Tishbite. And, and we learned a couple of weeks ago when Andrew spoke that he kind of came out of nowhere. Like, who is Elijah the Tishbite? We don't really have much of an idea, but that's how he was introduced. And by the end of chapter 17, after he goes through this years-long um, years uh, experience of, of just relying and depending on God completely, we see that he is declared Elijah, a man of God. And I think it's in the circumstances that Elijah finds himself in chapter 17, where his character is built up by the God who loves him, that points to us um, some ways that, that, that God builds character in his followers. Points to us some ways God built character in Elijah, and I think it can be pretty applicable for us today. So there's three specific things that I want to touch on as we read these couple of verses in 1 Kings 17. The first is Christian character is developed in listening for and listening to God's voice. The second is Christian character is developed in responding to God's calling in obedience. So not just merely listening to his voice, but responding in obedience. And the third is Christian character is developed in depending on his provision alone. So let's read um, 1 Kings 17. We'll start at verse 7, and uh, we'll read till verse 16. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up And the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Let's pray before we go any further. Father God, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the fact that we can come together and we can look into it and and, and we can study it and and apply it. And God, I pray that you'd give us open hearts and open ears to hear what you have to say to us this morning. God, I thank you for the opportunity it is to to lead us in in this this study. And God, I just pray that you would speak um, through me to your people. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So first, Christian character is developed in listening to God's voice. So in verse 8 we read, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. 
Elijah, as we heard from Andrew a couple weeks ago, he was not privy to all of God's plan. Instead, he listened step by step by step as God revealed more and more of his plan. So he was here at Kareth, being provided for in this drought by this brook and being fed by these birds that Andrew said were getting a little too handsy with his food. Um, and, and then the word of the Lord comes to him and gives him the next step. Go to Zarephath, which, by the way, was not some small journey. From what I understand, it was about a 70-mile hike across a country suffering from drought where Elijah was a wanted man. He was being hunted. He says, there God will provide through a widow. So the question, I guess, the challenge I have for us on this point is are we listening for God's voice in our lives? I've not experienced ever an audible voice that I could say that came from the Lord telling me what to do. And I think it's safe to assume that there'd be many in this room who would say they haven't experienced that ever either. But there are many ways in which God has given us that we can listen for his voice, that we can listen to what he has to say to us. A couple of them, spending time in his word, spending time getting to know him through what he has written down for us in his word. Praying, spending time in prayer, alone before God, asking him to reveal himself to us. Spending time with uh, our church family, with more mature believers, listening to their counsel. One thing for me that I love doing, spending time in creation. Getting to know God through, through the beauty of his creation. Another thing I love to do is, is spending time just, just serving him. That's why I love the camp ministry. That's why I've been involved with it in my whole life. Is I just love getting that opportunity to serve him in those contexts. And for years, I struggled with, with, um, with how I heard God's voice. Uh, we have this thing at camp called yo-yo time. It's you're on your own time. We did it at youth camp every year for a number of years. And what it is, is five or six hours, we send people out into to God's creation and we say, look, it's really important that you have this time alone just to hear God's voice. And some people would come back with these amazing stories about how, you know, they were sitting on the rock and the wind blew their Bible open to a certain page and they read it and it was just like directly what they needed to hear. Meanwhile, my yo-yo time experiences were often I'd fall asleep. Um, I would daydream, I'd get distracted. And for a long time, that was really discouraging to me. But I recognize, and I think we all need to recognize, that God designs each of us in a different way. So where some people really need that five, six hours alone to hear God's voice, for me, where I felt most in tune with God, where I felt that I could hear his voice most clearly, was in the, the hectic busyness of camp. In, in, in being in the kitchen where, you know, 600 dishes are coming through really fast and you have to keep up. In getting to know people as you're serving alongside of them, at, at um, taking care of a group of rowdy 9 to 11-year-old boys. And I recognize that that is how God has designed me to hear from him. Now, I'm not saying I don't need to spend time in his word, and I don't need to spend time in quiet praying to him, but understand that God has designed each of us differently. And if you hear God's voice most clearly in getting away into his creation and spending hours alone so you can just pause and listen, that is great and you should do that. If you hear God's voice most clearly when you're doing something, when you're active, when you're a part of something, then get to be a part of something so that you can set yourself up to hear his voice and listen for his direction and his guidance. So my point is this, whatever draws you to him, to him, spend time in that so you're better equipped to hear his voice. Because Christian character is built in listening and hearing God's voice. Second, Christian character is developed in responding to God's calling in obedience. In James chapter 1, it says this, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. In Sermon on the Mount, Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount by talking about this wise and this foolish builder. The wise builder builds his house on the rock, and the rains and the wind and the storm come, and the house stands firm. 
The foolish builder builds his house on the sand, the waves, the wind, the rain comes, and the house crashes. And what's the difference between these two men, the wise and the foolish builder? They both hear Jesus' teaching. One chooses to put it into action, and the other doesn't. So don't just merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Don't just hear God's voice, read his word, but do what it says. Respond in obedience. So God calls and Elijah goes. He makes this long, dangerous journey because God tells him to go. He didn't try, from what we read in scripture, what's there, he didn't try to figure out the logic behind it. He didn't try to argue his way out of it. Well, it's it's kind of a dangerous journey. I don't think I should go. Can't you just keep supplying this brook with water? And remember, too, that as we read this story in 1 Kings 17, it happens within a chapter, but this is a a years-long thing that's happening with Elijah. And through all these years, through all the hardships I'm sure there were, he continued to listen and obey God's voice. Do we respond to God in obedience? I'm sure, I'm pretty sure, none of us in this room will be called to stand before an evil king and and then wait three years in a desert as a whole nation struggles with famine. But what about in those seemingly smaller things in life? Do we respond to God in obedience? What about in simply just getting out of your house and loving your neighbor? What about in um, serving those who, who are less fortunate than us? What about forgiving those who have wronged you? Are we obedient in those things? Living in obedience day to day builds character. And we have no idea the kind of impact that will have ultimately on our lives and lives around us. I went to a church a couple of years ago where I was speaking, and uh, a man there, I'll call him Jim, his name wasn't Jim, but we'll call him Jim, um, he told a story. He told a story of getting a call from an old co-worker who he worked at, with, uh, at the mines. He worked with him at the mines. And this was years, this was years and years after Jim had retired, after this man had retired, and they really had no relationship beyond work. They weren't friends, they didn't catch up with each other, they, they just kind of left their separate ways. And Jim said that, that he was a Christian uh, at the time when, when he was working at the mines. Uh, he, he made a decision to follow Jesus, and in doing that, he determined to go to his work every day, and amongst the negativity and some of the, maybe the, the negative talk and whatever else it might have been, he was going to live differently. He didn't get up on a table and preach to people. He didn't do anything really spectacular. He just determined that he was going to go and work as if he was working for God. This man calls him years after and says, hey, can you come and visit me? So Jim says, sure. He goes and visits the man, and the man tells him that he's just been diagnosed with cancer. He has a few months to live. And he said to him, and this is what I find so fascinating about this story, he said, I noticed there, there was a difference in you. And I knew it had something to do with God, but I want you to explain that a little more to me because I need that. And this man, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it was, after working with this guy, was able to go evangelize, witness to this, uh, this man who called Jim uh, to visit with him, made a decision to follow Jesus, and now his eternity has literally been changed by the small obedience that Jim showed in working every day. A couple of weeks ago, there was a baptism. Young guy Titus mentioned going to camp and observing Dave, Lawrence, for those of you who don't know Dave, or never got to know Dave, uh, he was a man of character. And his simple obedience in just loving people who came into his cabin, simple obedience, changed hundreds of lives. That's what Christian obedience is all about. Men and women of character obey God. Third, Christian character is developed in depending on his provision 
alone. This is where I I think we really do see uh, Elijah's character being built, as he must depend on God in this circumstance that is less than ideal. He left what sounded like a pretty good hiding spot uh, to go and travel. And from what I understand in reading the commentaries, the land that he was traveling to was the king's father's, father-in-law's land. So the king's wife, who's responsible for a lot of this persecution of the Jewish people, that's where he was traveling to. So from what appeared to be fairly safe to what appeared not to be safe, through a country where he was a wanted man, he was being hunted. He had to depend on God for his safety. He was told that a widow would provide for him. And we meet this widow as we read this story. And we meet her collecting sticks. And he says to her, hey, can you provide me with some water? And she responds by going to get him some water. And then he throws in, oh, also some bread. She looks at him and says, we have no bread. We have a little jar of flour and a little jug of oil. That's all we have. We are going to go. I'm lighting a fire. We're making this meal, and it's going to be our last. Which I found interesting as I'm reading this story, because God tells Elijah, I'm going to direct this widow to look after you. And apparently, she wasn't told anything. (laughs) But he did direct her to be obedient. Because Elijah says, you make this bread, give me some first, which seems like a bit of an audacious ask, Give me some first, I'll eat, then you can eat, and you will see that this flour and this oil never runs out. She responds in obedience, and we see that Elijah, this woman, and her son depend on God to provide for them physically. And we see this this miraculous thing that happens. And I was even reading one commentary that said uh, the miracle was so precise in that God could have said, look, I'll give you a storehouse full of flour and a storehouse full of oil, and you don't have to worry about it. But the one commentator pointed out that in the midst of this famine and this little widow who had all this stuff, she likely would have been uh, attacked, maybe even killed for what she had. So instead, God provided as they needed it. His provision was perfect. God provides. We know that as Christians here this morning. We won't always know how, but we can depend on his provision. In the midst of trials, God provides. Financial hardship, God provides. In the midst of heartache, God provides provides. When we are struggling in our own faith, God provides. In our ministries and what God has called us to do, He provides. And as we see this provision, as we depend on this provision, our character grows, and our trust in Him and our faith in Him grows. As I think of God's provision, and we'll wrap it up here, I think of Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. When thinking of God's provision, this is where we need to anchor ourselves. We were dead, we were lost, we were without hope, deserving of wrath, but God, in his great love, provided a way through Jesus. This is what our faith is anchored on. We are provided opportunity to be a part of what he has in store for us here on this earth, to be a part of the kingdom work that he is doing here on this earth. And we are provided hope in an eternal and secure future in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Do you recognize this provision in your life? Jesus provided the foundation on which we can build a life of character, pursuing the goal of becoming more like him. 
I try to think of a challenge for each message for myself and that I can share with you all. And as I was thinking about that this week, one thing really came to my mind. And this is, this is what it was. I was thinking this week, I've spent a lot of time digging into God's Word, preparing for this message. I've spent a lot of time reading and praying and, and just asking God for guidance and direction as I prepare. And I thought, this fits perfectly into what I think this passage is saying. That I was willing to spend all this time because, for lack of a better word, I had a, a big thing coming up in, in, in having the opportunity to speak here this morning. But next week, when I don't have anything coming up on the weekend where, where I have the opportunity to preach or anything like that, am I going to be just as, as zealous and just as passionate about digging into his word? Because Christian character is built in that day-to-day -day obedience, the day-to-day -day listening to God's voice, the day-to-day -day in, in depending on his provision in our lives. So maybe you feel like you have nothing big coming up, but understand that God wants our obedience and our devotion all the time. And in this devotion and in these, this obedience in the little things, we see that character build. And he prepares us for things that we have no idea are coming. So my challenge is this. This week, recognize that day to day there are little things that might come up. Turn to God's word. Look to obey him and recognize that those things are building character in you that, that, that you have no idea when that's going to come into play in your lives. And that's a really good thing, and it's a thing that I think we can, we can really strive towards putting an effort into and, and just becoming more like our Savior. So let's pray, and then I think the team has one last song for us. Father God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your Son. I thank you that... Um, we can gather this morning and, and look into your word. And God, I just pray that um, we would be people who um, determine to, uh, to listen to your voice, to obey your voice, and just to, to see that you provide for us so completely. God, I thank you for the character that that builds. God, I pray that we would be a church, that we would be individuals who build day to day on that character. Thank you for your love, and we thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If we could please stand again.